turning us on. Probably have to move my mic a little bit closer, but I'll let uh, Jacob and the Benny tell me all about that. Hey, we got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about dreaming. And uh, as soon as my guest joins us, Sarah, uh, Sarah James, we're going to be talking about her new book, Dream Mysteries, where she shares uh, we're going to get some research into into sleep. What does it mean? And, you know, what is it about dreams that has fascinated all of us? Let's just talk about this for a minute. If we could just get a little bit of real with this. One of the things that is almost universal is it doesn't matter what language you talk, you say it in, what country or how you phrase it. When you talk about this idea of dreams, you're pretty much not leaving many cultures out. But he, here's what we know, right? Let me just let me just tell you a little bit about this. There are some cultures who their entire history, or shall I say, a large part of their history of prophecy is based on dreams. Now, many of you are thinking, well, like, what is she talking about? Well, no, I'm not just talking about ancient Egypt. But I mean, if you think about everything from Christianity, you know, to some of the Buddha traditions, what you're looking at is the power of dreams, the power of visions. You know, how often have you read something where you hear something about dreams? And I, I tell you, I'm going to kick this off a little bit because this is an interesting year. It's Chinese New Year over the weekend. Of course, I'm very familiar with, I'm very familiar with the Asian traditions for a very good reason. Uh, all you got to do is look in my background and you'll get a sense of it. Uh, the picture in the back was uh, literally a painting that was done by my acupuncturist mom. And it was a special painting that was, you know, designed and crafted um, uh, for me many years ago. And it came from her vision of a dream. And, you know, I, I, when I think about this, I think about how connected we are to our imagination to the evolution of it, to our memory, to the consciousness, to our consciousness of thought. And I think about what would be the power for all of us if our consciousness of thought could guide the ship, could guide the way. And I think about that, like, I think about that for myself because this is coming up, this is our 20th year. Um, later on in the year, it will, it will literally be like the 20th, like later on in the year. But this is the year, this is the year that if you go back 2003 and when I first met Benny, uh, I, I didn't, I had no idea. I mean, I'm like, what are we doing here? Like crust busting your way to an awesome life, you know? And so when I thought about this back then, you know, it was very clear to me that I had this business card and on the back of the business card, it was very clear. It said, I wanted to reach a million people to help them live life full out. I mean, that is what it said. I wanted to reach a million people to help them live life full out. And I remember sitting in the studio, Benny, I think you remember this when Jack came in, Jack Canfield, and he came into Seattle, came into the studio. I got to spend some time with him. And I pulled out this orange crust busting card and, you know, he and I were talking about it. And I love the way people receive this idea of crust busting. It's so much fun. Um, and what we're learning about this now is we're learning that ideas like this that were so off the beaten path. So what the heck do I mean? I mean, look, if you go back 20 years ago, what kind of talk radio were you listening to? You know, what podcasting? I mean, my gosh, you know, we had my, I think myself and Jeff, we had one of the first largest archives online um, uh, gallery we, uh, of shows. And back in the day, there was no AWS. There was, I mean, think about it. Like, I don't even know, did we even have cell phones? I think we had flip phones. I'm not sure what we had, but if you think about where we were and where we come, it is a culmination of dreams, of visions, of so many people that had an idea and brought it to the forefront. I mean, everybody joked about this back in 2003 or so when Al Gore declared that uh, he invented the internet. I still don't know if he did or he didn't. But how does an idea like that come out? 
I mean, think about it. Like we're sitting back in the day and we're like reams of data. <clears throat> I think Benny will tell you, like, I used to come into the studio at KKNW and I used to bring all these like binders, like filled with notes and what I was going to talk to somebody about. And, but that was the way, you know, the preparation for things was really an agonizing process. I mean, we all know this. Anybody that is now plugged into the world understands that this is a world that evolved, that what we're talking about here is the evolution of information in a way that comes through that goes beyond TikTok, that goes beyond Instagram, Facebook, all of those. It is, it is an acceleration of ideas. That's the way I see this. People always ask me, ah, what do you think? What do you think about dreaming? And what do you think about, the, you know, what was your vision? What was your dream? What did you do? I'm like, I don't even understand the question. What do you, what are, what, what's my vision? You know, most of my life, I tried to figure out how to survive. So when you're in the survival mode, right? All you're doing is putting one foot in front of the other. You're grateful you have a job. You think that, oh my God, if I can get promoted, I'm going to get that big, bigger paycheck. And then you do. And then you reach a point of total despair and disgust because all the things you thought that career was going to bring you does not. But yet at the same time, you like the cha-ching and the money. But is there something else in your heart? I mean, is there something that's in, for me, I've always had something in my heart, but it, it manifested in the weirdest thing, the weirdest dream. Not so weird when I look back now, but it did. At a very young age, I remember walking down the halls of Bell Labs. And I got to tell you how absolutely phenomenal it was working in the Bell Lab culture. Let me tell you about Bell Labs for a minute. We all know about the old AT&T. Well, a lot of people don't. But if you're from my generation or, or, or around that time, you understand there used to be a thing called Ma Bell. Uh, now, not so much. But that company was the bedrock for what you have now, for what you're, for everything you do in your hands, your cell phones, those systems that were developed by those companies built an infrastructure that set the world out, including the cable infrastructure. And so when it, when Bell, Bell Laboratories or AT&T got challenged as a monopoly and, and, and in came Judge Green to break the company up, it sent us off on a different pathway. That's where we got to be today. But what was it like before that? Who had the vision? Was it Alexander Bell? Who had the vision? The thing I love when I think back about those early years of my life, I love how smart the God of my understanding is. I do, because here I am, like, I'm not even 20. I don't even know what age that was. I started working at Bell Labs very young, just saying everybody. But I was walking down the halls and they gave me this mail trip. I was delivering mail at $61 a week. Honestly, never thought, I, 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 I didn't think that I would get a job. I mean, it wasn't exactly in my wheelhouse to be disciplined. I was out 48 days in my senior year. And I think about these things that connect the dots for us. I think about the way we dream, the way we heal. And I wonder back then if that was something I tapped into, but I didn't know it. Let me ask all of you. So you're walking down the hall with your best friend. Well, you don't know she's going to be a best friend. You, you don't know like, okay, like a gazillion years later, like this person's even going to be talking to you, right? But I'm walking down the hall with Linda and I'm in Bell Labs and Bell Labs is the laboratory of basic research. We don't even do much of that anymore because it's hard to get funded. This is the place where they test sounds. This was the place where a gentleman, Dr. Arno Penzias and, and Wilson, those two guys in collaboration with another group, what did they do? The big bang, big bang, like boom, the universe is born. This is a guy, this is a man, I think he drove like a 48 Buick, brought in bagels on Friday, and I would go, like, I'm like a teenager, and I would go down there and, and called him the bagel guy. 
because because I'm telling you, it's just me. But these people were extraordinary for me. So here's the question really for all of us today. I mean, what is it that's touching you, that's igniting you, that's helping you tap into something today? Because I didn't know then that this group of researchers, and let me just tell you about them, they were the funnest people, like totally like the funnest, like so much fun, like fun. And I'm telling you, when I'm a teenager, I I was like all about the fun. I was just all about the fun. It was like, okay, I'm working three jobs so I can go party. That That's just the way that was. But I met these people because I had something in my heart but meeting these people, igniting something that brought me to where I am today. And if you think about it, you could see the dots in my life, how they got connected. Because I'm delivering mail to people that had a sound room, people that I related to. You go into building 15, oh my gosh. Do you believe they actually gave me top security clearance? I couldn't believe it. Like here I am, like homeless at 17. And then the next thing I know, I have top security clearance like you know like the government like top clearance so i tried to behave during that period of time a little bit but i can't believe they gave me top security but they did because i was delivering mail to building 15. and i later went on to work um in in a part of the company that they were all about military so here I am and i'm going to building 15 i love going i love going so much that i would miss half of my mail trips to other places that doesn't go over very big if they catch you but here I go and I meet these incredible people but on the way you know I'm walking down building one because building one that was that's that was the building and I deliver mail to all these people and I meet this incredible mathematician guy and he's got this PhD on the end of his name and he teaches me how to juggle again not my strong suit but I could juggle I could juggle two balls but how much fun is this? Wow. Then I go down another hall and I meet these other people and they show me how to mix chemicals. Okay. So I'm thinking really top security clearance. And now they're showing me how to mix chemicals. Okay. That's just like a formula for nightmare on Elm street part 16, but they created cool stuff. You know, I watched them do weird things like heat up coffee and make food before we even had microwaves. I mean, it was just incredible. But this was a body of work that was the underpinning for so many patents, so many scientific discoveries. See, but I didn't know that. I just knew they had fun. And then, then, oh my gosh. And then I meet an incredible guy. His name really is Howard Stern, but he's not the Stern. Like he's not that one. But I meet this guy and he's from Germany and he's a machinist. And so he's the guy that puts all the parts together. And he sees me one day and he, and I said, to him, where are you going? He says, I'm going to play ping pong. Oh, now what happens? And here I am. I'm like following him up to the fifth floor of another building called building two, the boiler room top of the floor. And I'm following him up there. And what do I find? At the elevators, when the elevators get off, I'm building, building, here we go. The building five or building two, whatever. And the elevators, you come off and out was a ping pong table because that's where they played every lunch religiously, ping pong. So he introduced me to playing ping pong at that level. I later went on to play ping pong at New Jersey. But all of this is happening in... And all I know is PhD. Everybody had the PhD. There's like at the end of their name and I would take their mail and I would, well, I would attempt to deliver their mail, but you had to imagine this, right? You had to imagine walking into somebody's office, couldn't find the mailbox or bin because the mail is like piled up everywhere. And it is so funny. I have that same habit. <laughs> I have that same habit today. Now you walk in there, but this, these, who are these people? So I don't know what that means. I don't know what PhD is. I didn't understand they were the top scientists in the world. I'm not just talking about the United States. I mean, in the world, 
I mean, Dr. Arno Penzias and, you know, his discovery talking about the Big Bang, the or Big Bang, the origins of the universe. All I knew is he would save that cinnamon bagel for me. That's what I knew, right? And you go sit there and you talk about them. You talk about random things with this man, right? It wasn't a right or wrong answer. You just had a conversation with the genius type person and he treated you. See, this is what I loved. All of these people taught me a lesson. They taught me this lesson that people are people. Things at the back of, on the end of your name, whatever that is, these are credentials, they're not pe they're, we're all people. And I never felt less than at all, except playing ping pong. I really felt less than until I got better. But I never felt less than. I mean, I, I, they didn't look at me as the male girl. And yes, that's what they called you, male girl. The male girl. They never looked at you like that. They always had something interesting to talk to you about, right? And it was fascinating for me because I would have to go out and I'd have to go outside to go to building 15. That's how secure building 15 was. It couldn't even be, it couldn't even be attached to the rest of the building at Murray Hill, New Jersey. It couldn't even be like, it had to be like its own little building. And I remember this, this was the epiphany for me. I remember an experience with building 15 that did something to me in a way that I couldn't believe. This is, there's, a, there's a room in building 15 and it's a special room. And if you looked at the room from the outside or you open the door, it's covered with charcoal, Benny and, Benny and Jacob know the term, charcoal, let's call it soundproofing. And I always thought it was fascinating. But one day, towards the end of my tenure as a male girl, because I was there longer than most because they did catch me not delivering mail, so I had to stay there longer. But one day, when this guy that I was always see sleeping on the couch, but just this one day, that I happened to get there at the right time. He actually woke up and introduced himself to me. And what happened next was something I had never experienced before. It would change my life. Something happened on that day in that moment that I now understand better. When we come back from break, I'm going to tell you what that is. I'm going to tell you what happened on that day that changed the way I saw the world, but I didn't have the tools I have now. I understand it so perfectly now, today. I get it today. But back then, 17 years old, all I know is I had an experience. When we come back from break, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you about the experience. Probably kept me out of jail, but I'm going to tell you about the experience that happened to me from this great guy with a really long beard who talked to frogs in building 15 when we come back from break. Let's take a short break, Benny. You're listening to the Dr. Pat Show. I'm Dr. Pat. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. You're listening to Transformation Talk Network. We'll be right back. All clear. Thank you. It's just me. Yeah, no, Sarah. That's all right. I'm just going to keep rolling. Be the creator of your own healthy life Those, with uh, the most Bell unbeatable Bell connected weight uh, loss experience Bell through Lab. Impact Remote Bell Academy. You will get a customized six month Jersey. program that is fat loss yeah. focused with simple Arno to follow Pensy. step by step instructions, Zoom coach support, um, and, and then access then the to the Academy website happen, tools Bell, and community. Bell because Bell weight loss is hard and you deserve the best support. Look no further. Everything you need for weight loss success is accessible through Impact Remote Academy kit and support. This is your healthy journey to permanent weight loss. 
weight loss, and we're going to give you the keys to unlock your inner power and optimal health through clean eating and self-love. The No More Rules gal Steph Yost and Camille Barreto are here to help you recognize self-sabotaging patterns and develop healthy lifestyle habits. Explore yourimpactwellness.com for all the details. That's yourimpactwellness.com. And remember to live your life with impact. Um, but they would join the new earth the on the Cornelia points. Stephanie show and tune in each the, month as Cornelia takes listeners on an world, odyssey right? of but higher consciousness to inspire, to educate, and empower. And it would be Cornelia Stephanie is a like spiritual like teacher, passionate speaker, published author, and founder of the Empower Network. Cornelia guides people on the path of self healing, peace, and liberation. For more information, um, go to corneliastephanie.com. I think it was in Reddington. It was Have you been on life's roller coaster farm. trying to figure out and, what to do uh, next? Then join Greta and me, Yvonne, in the Realm of Beings each Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Now they have equipment. Shake the dust off your cold. wings and fly to the highest yeah. heights so that was in your Love's thoughts and actions. The, uh, Express the your guy, greatness. Be a champion for Arno yourself. Kenzie's. And we'll see you he there Wilson, on Chipping Operations Conversations group. with the Realm he, of Beings. His name is the one that's attached to the Big Bang. Gotcha. Are you looking for a way to break old yeah, habits that are holding you back from reaching your true potential and living the life you deserve? Well, look no further than Dr. Loretta Billups. You know, we don't she do is a clinician much. and a really relationship and a mental health coach that will assist you with reaching you know, a lot your of purpose. Were like, she will wow, hold you accountable you so that your desires are now a reality. Company. Connect with Dr. B well, at cultivatingyourlife.com and find your path today. That's cultivatingyourlife.com. Tune into the Life Strategy yeah. Show with your life Linda, strategy mentor, Lolita Smith, and say yes to bringing prosperity and success to your future right here and right now. Okay. Life We're is a picture of your mind, and Lolita is here to help you imagine it. it. Say goodbye to the strings of the past that have been holding you back for far too long. No, Rise up with Lolita going. and say yes to the solutions, yes. prosperity, and unlimited possibility. Visit LifeStrategyMentor.com. That's LifeStrategyMentor.com. All right, coming back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Patro. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. We're talking about dreams, but we're talking about dreams in a way that maybe you, you haven't heard on this show. So what I want to say about this is, I don't know if you know it or not, but dreams are like a little seed. Like you plant a seed, right? You know, everybody talks about the acorn. Like the acorn falls down and then like it goes into something, right? That's what they said, the acorn. But there are many other things that pollinate. Like I, I'm, I'm so fascinated by seeds. Growing up in the Bronx, like my dad, hello, backyard, once upon a time when we actually moved from where we lived in the projects, we moved. We had a backyard. What did my dad do? See, I still think to this day he was burying some people back there because who pours cement in your grass backyard? Like, who does that? I mean, I don't even understand that. Like, I don't know what his thinking was. Like, what? You didn't want to cut like 200 square foot of grass? But that's what he did. But there are many things we learn about seeds. And there are many things you learn that even cement can't hide. You know, seeds just have a way of growing. They just have a way of growing. And, you know, I was talking, I was talking about Dr. Dr. Arno Allen Penzias, and I was talking about my journey in building 15. I want to finish the rest of that story because I, I have learned that the God of my understanding is so much smarter than like a fourth grader. Like, like we all think we're smart. Like we all think, you know, some parts of it, we're just smart, but there are things that happen in life. I mean, they just happen. And you don't know that what they are going to do, they set you up. They set you up. So here I am building 15, bearded guy wakes up from the couch. And I'm always very quiet when I go in there. First of all, this, this building 15, this particular space, you could hear yourself breathing even when you're not. Like if you hold your breath, like you could hear it. This was the hub, very secret chamber for sound. Everything that had to do with sound 
building 15. Frogs. I mean, they didn't hurt the frogs. They didn't cut them up. So I just want to say frogs, insects, anything that made a noise in this room, right? This guy would sleep with the frogs and the, I don't even know what the insects were. But this one day he wakes up and he looks at me and I said, I don't know, remember what I said. I just was like, I, like I got, you got mail. <laughs> Maybe that's what I said. Uh, and I said, I said something like, this is like, this, this place is crazy. This, this is, I just love this. And I'm always quiet. And he says, he said to me, he said, I'm always trying to be very quiet. He says, you know, this is a quiet room. I said, yes, I'm always trying to be very quiet when I come in the room. So imagine me, I'm trying to be, I got this metal mail cart that you draw, that you're walking around the hallway. And I'm saying to the guy, I'm trying to be quiet. He said, no, this is a quiet room. It has any, it, I forget what he said, Benny and Jacob. It was some ridiculous, like zero to, to, to like one decibel of, of any sound. Of course it went over my head and he looked at me, he said, let me show you. So off I go with this guy that I've seen a lot over a six month period, never really met. And he says, I want to show you, I want you to experience something because then you'll understand sound, but you'll understand quiet. And he took me to this room in building 15. The room was approximately, I would say it was a good 500 square foot room. And when you open the door from the outside, it looks like nothing. It looks like that door right there that you can't see, but it's right there. It looks like just a door on the outside, but it was a very heavy door it was I would venture to say it had to be metal and he opens the door and it is pitch black in this room. But what's even more interesting is the entire walls, the ceiling, the floor, the door, the backside of the door is covered with this charcoal. I'm going to call it soundproofing, but I think, I think Jacob and Benny, it's like up level from that. I think it's like soundproofing and then stuff. And he said, look, do you want to have an experience? Now, back then, I'm like, oh, anything. Is it a Jimi Hendrix experience? I don't care. Like, yeah. I was like, yes, sure. He said, I want you to take off your shoes and I'm going to, I'm going to guide you into this room and see if you can see what it's like to sit in this room. I'm only going to leave you in the room for a minute or two. And I'm thinking, like, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to be like electrocuted or something? That, what, like, the only one? He said, Yeah, I'm a, I don't want to leave you in the room more than a minute or two if you've never had an experience. Like, I'm thinking, okay, now I'm like, oh, now you've got my attention. So most people would have turned around and like went out. But you know what? I was in conversation with Dr. Penzias, this American physicist, you know, radio astronomer. Who would have known that I meet a guy back in the day? a radio astronomer and my pathway would lead me to radio. Of course, Nobel, Nobel Prize in Physics, along with Robert Wilson, what a tag team. They discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation, which helped establish the Big Bang Theory of cosmology. Why am I sharing this? You see this room? Also, he went to Columbia. He's actually the guy that encouraged me to go to Columbia and City College of New York. He actually encouraged me to do that back then. I didn't get there till a lot of years later, folks, like 20 years later, but I never forgot it. But where did they study the quietest of sound? Yeah, they had these big, I mean, if you saw some of the backdrop, maybe Jeff, Jacob can get some, if you saw some of the backdrop, right, of things, and you saw like these big, big, you know, like the movie from Contact, right? Remember that movie Contact with Jodie Foster? Just imagine that. But however, this, this gentleman, I don't remember his name because I never went back in that room after this day. So he was telling me that they study something. I think it was a phrase like zero tolerance 
for noise. What? I mean, how, we, we, zero, I mean, you don't hear a fan in the background. You can't hear the hissing of the wiring in your wall. Maybe you're hearing, maybe you've got something in the background. Maybe you got us in the background. You know, maybe you're multitasking because that's what you're doing. Plus your cell phone's pinging. Even in the desert on Vision Quest, I was never able to duplicate this experience. Why? Because there's sounds in the desert. But how about space? Are there sounds in space? If you've ever watched anything on TV, especially like that movie Gravity, you know, space, sounds. What are there sounds? If you are in space, not with a ship or a rocket, are there sounds? The closest I came to this experience I'm about to tell you about was skydiving. Not the fall, not the free fall at 120 miles an hour, not that part, but the part after it. So in I go, take my shoes off, and he walks me in the room. And obviously, this is a place he's been in. And he says, I want you to sit down, but you have to promise me you're not going to get up. I will come back for you in 60 to 90 seconds. And, and so now I'm getting like a little, oh, oh, oh my, what is this? Is this like, okay, this is like a horror movie almost, but I was still intrigued. So he walks me in this room. And so the minute I walk in the room, even with the door open, and there are no lights, just telling you, no lights. There's only lights. There was only lights that he turned on just briefly. But he told me later why there are no lights or no electricity in this room. Because lights and electricity and wiring create sound. There's sound that comes from your wall. You just can't hear it. Insects hear it. Dogs hear it. But there wasn't any of that in this room. Just when he opened the door, the light would come in. And he always carried, um, I think it was like a flashlight or something. I can't remember now. And he walked me in and he sits me down into what I, what I know is the middle of the room. I didn't know it then. And he sits down and he says, don't move. Be quiet as you can. Just sit. I'll be back in 60 to 90 seconds. And he goes out and the door shuts. I don't even know how to explain this feeling. Everything stopped. There was no sound. I could feel my, I could feel my own breath. I could hear my heartbeat, but something happened to me. It was so quiet. It was so peaceful. And with my eyes open, I couldn't see. It was dark with my eyes open. And there was a point by which I sat in this room and I just surrendered to it. Meaning I didn't fight. I didn't move. And I, I, the ground was even padded where I was sitting the whole room. I'm telling you, it was soundproof, um, beyond anything you can imagine. And I remember laying, just laying down 60, 90 seconds felt like an eternity. But something happened to me. I had never had my mind be quiet. I grew up in a very tough childhood, abuse in Catholic boarding school, moms commit suicide. I mean, I'm just saying homelessness, that will knock the you know what out of you, but it teaches you great things. Alcohol and drugs were great to numb my mind. But this experience, and I could see my future. I could literally see it, but just in seconds. Now I couldn't see the details of it, but I could see this PhD thing. I, I could see glimpses of things that I could hear nothing. There was nothing, there was no sound. And I even quieted my breath because I so wanted to be without noise, without sound. 
and I found my mind stop. Like, how, why would that be? I mean, why wouldn't my mind just keep crazy racing? Why would my mind stop? How did this all happen? I felt like I was in there for hours, days. You know, I could see things and I say see things, but it's not the right word. Let me just say I could know things. I could know things about my future, but I couldn't know them. I couldn't articulate that I'd be sitting here talking to you. That talking to a, a guy by the name of Arno Penzias, I called him the bagel man. Um, boy, I didn't know any of that. How did I know that he would talk to me about radio? And he'd plant a seed about radio, although he wasn't talking about radio, radio. But I found out later he's talking about a whole different radio astronomer, a radio astronomer. But here I am in this room. I swear it felt more than a couple of minutes in this room. It's almost as if in that movie Contact, if you saw that, it's like she was gone for, I don't know what she was gone for, seconds or minutes. I don't know. Jacob would have to look it up. But to the rest of the world, right, she was gone seconds or minutes. But for her own experience, it was like a lifetime. It's like a bunch of lifetimes. Now, many of you listening would be thinking, oh, you discovered what meditation does. You discovered when people think of mindfulness, that's what, that's what like the end game of mindfulness might be. And I've come to know, I've had other experiences like that, but none like this. And then the door opens. I didn't want to leave the room. The light was blinding, just a little crack in the door in this soundproof room. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced zero decibels, zero. I am not talking about, yeah, I, I, so, later on, somebody said to me, it's a negative number. I don't even know what that means, but it's zero. Like when you have your microphone out and you watch your microphone, even in the quietest of places, you could hear your refrigerator running. You probably could hear an ant crawling on the floor. The wiring in your walls make sounds. There's sounds coming in from the outside. Zero, no humming, no buzzing, zero. A place of peace that was so profoundly crazy for me. It changed my perspective. Because I'll, I'll tell you, up to that point, I didn't think I had a future. I lived day by day by day. I was surprised I was even alive then. It changed me. It changed me. It changed the way I looked about my future, about the way I looked about, at people in my life. But it took me a lot of years to figure it out. And I walked out of that room. And I remember walking down the hall. I can't remember the time frame of this all. It's like a blur to me, but I remember the association. It may have even been years after that experience. I remember talking, to, walking down the hall and telling Linda. I just I was just right there at the Bell Labs. And I'm like, Linda, I'm going to get a PhD. And Linda looked at me. And you have to understand me. I'm a kid that graduated high school couldn't read, couldn't write. I graduated high school in summer school because I won a bet with my lit teacher. 48 days out my senior year, couldn't put a sentence together, stuttered most of my, my young, young years, not, you know, stuttered enough to really be annoying to people. But I looked at her and said, I get a PhD. Had no clue what that was. Why did I declare that? You know, some people will say, and that was association. And I agree. I mean, I delivered mail. Remember, everybody almost, I'd say 90% of the people at the end of their name, like the mail, PhD, that was at the end of their name. 90%. 
all I knew is these people, PhD, fun. They're the funnest people. They're happy, they're, right? You know, bearded guy from the quiet room with the frogs, PhD, gave me that experience. So I made that connection. However, I know that moment or moments in that space, in that quiet, revealed the future to me. And it was a future I couldn't understand. But I knew that I had to put the dots together to get there. I didn't know how. See, this is why I love doing this show and I love talking to you. Because you may think you're the most unlikely person, fill in your own blank. I am the most unlikely person to dot, 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 dot. Just try it, fill it in. And you'll find that the fact that you can even declare something means you're not the most unlikely person. I never thought I was the most unlikely person to get a PhD. It never entered my mind that I would have to go to a gazillion years of school just to even get there. Had no interest in going back to school. It wasn't my wheelhouse. I wanted to work a bunch of jobs, make money, have fun, play softball and ping pong. Until one day, Dan Vandermoss and Brian McGorry got out of that mailroom job, got to work in the payroll with 50 other people. And I remember Brian saying to me, look, you've got to go to school. You, you've, you're, you've got potential. You've got to go to school. And I'm like, Brian. Uh, by the time I get out of here, because clerks don't get to leave Bell Labs early to go to school. I said, Brian, by the time I get out of here to go to school, you let me out at five, time to get my car. Then I got to go, like, you want me to go to Fairleigh Dickinson? Okay, it's like up the road. I get my car, get to Fairleigh Dick. I, I can't get in the five o'clock class. And if I can't get in the five o'clock class, I'm in the eight o'clock class. And then I'm in the eight o'clock class and then I go to school from eight to 11. Then you want me to come in here like at seven o'clock. I'm like, I, I don't see it happening. And I said, it's not that I can't do it, but why can't I leave 15 minute early? Why can't I? No, clerks don't leave early. You're like a clerk. That's what you got called. I was a clerk for 10 years there. You don't leave early. So what did this guy do? See, this is what happens when you're open to possibilities. This is the thing, like open to the possibility of spending 90 seconds in a room that felt like 90 years where you have a sense of knowing that you didn't have when you went in there. You have a sense of clarity on the possibilities, but you don't know how to get there. And then the pieces start to fall in place. Then. The, the breadcrumbs are laid out in front of you. What is your job? Your job is to say yes. Even if they're gluten-free breadcrumbs, you look at them and you say yes. And you figure out in life what doesn't work well. When I got out of that mail room, Dara Stoner, who hired me despite 48 days, said, I don't know what it is about you. I'm going to hire you. I shouldn't hire you. We don't hire people out 48 days in their senior year. But there's something about you. I'm going to hire She did. And she also found me my first job out of the mailroom was the worst fit on the planet. Me in a library. What? Routine job filing books in the Dewey Decimal System. Eight hours a day, five days a week. Oh my God. Can you even imagine that? I was in there two weeks and I went storming back to Dara Stoner's room like very unorthodox. These are HR people. And I walked in, I said, I can't do it. You got to get me out of here. You got to get me out of here. Breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs. You have to be clear on what fits for you and what doesn't. And if it doesn't fit, you need to walk away. Dara says, you're the luckiest person I know. Why? I don't know. She says, it's a job opening and payroll. Let me make a call. Payroll. A room of 50 people in one room, 50 people identified in little groups on the functions. 
Dan Vandermoss, I wrote about in the first chapter of the book I did for Peggy Wilms. Brian McGorry, he taught me a lesson about breaking rules that I've never forgotten. Thank you, No More Rules, Steph, and uh, yeah, Camille. Brian says, I'm going to sign your tuition papers. You're going to leave a quarter to five. I did not know that he did something so unorthodox. This is a fast track guy. And this guy was the, what do you call that? The, the, the pride and joy of up and coming management people, Brian McGorry. Signed my form 15 minutes early. I was the first clerk in the history of the Bell system. I'm not, kidding. I'm not just talking about Bell Labs. I'm not talking the whole system because it had a GED. It had a, a guidebook. There were there were like 20 guidebooks, like all the instructions. That's what they were. It said no clerks, no clerks don't leave. 15 minutes signs the form gets called up by the AVP, HR, everybody, because why here I am in a room of 50 people and I'm walking out 15 minutes early. Can you imagine what the rest of the people in the room and it didn't matter back then you couldn't start 15 minutes early and leave. No, it's your job was this to this, you get lunch, this to this end of the story. You don't leave earlier. You don't take extra lunch. That's it. That's the way it was done. And here I am two days a week, I'm packing up, of course, a little earlier and I'm walking out of there. Do you think for one minute that that didn't cause chaos in the bell system? And I later found out Ryan McGurry was called out by the entire board. And he said to them, I'm not wrong. She's not wrong. You need to change your policy. And the policy was changed to allow people, clerks, we were called, to leave early. And there were so many instructions written about them. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Here's the thing. Can you imagine 60 seconds, 90 seconds of your life changing the pathway, pulling out a destiny for you, igniting dreams you didn't think you had, Putting in your consciousness this thing of a PhD it took me a lot of years to get there, but I had help. It took me 13 years to get an undergraduate degree. The only reason I, 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 I went faster is because they threatened not to promote me. Back in 19, it's, they were like, we're not going to promote you. You don't have a degree. And I'm like, okay, I'll get it done. And then losing my job after 24 and a half year, and I didn't lose it. I caused that to happen because I could no longer work in a place that didn't have integrity and care about people. But you see, all of this was orchestrated in a way that I got a glimpse of in a very, very strange situation in building 15 in a room where I got a glimpse of this, but I couldn't make sense of it. I never lost it though. I never lost the vision. And what I wanna to say to you guys now is that's not, vision's not over. See, that vision went beyond me sitting here talking to you. And there were times I thought, I don't know how that's going to happen. I, I don't really, how, how's that going to happen? I don't understand how that's going to happen. Why did I spend hours talking to Arno about radio and radio, radio frequency? Like, why? Like, who does that over bagels? See, it's all this incredible plan. It's like beautifully orchestrated. Capture your 60 seconds. Capture that 60 seconds. Find a place where, you, and I have tried to duplicate this over and over again. I would venture to say even the best sound rooms in the world don't, can't do it because most of them have electricity, like sound rooms where you record. That electricity causes a frequency that you subconscious can hear, but boy, I've tried. I've tried it in the desert. I've come close. I've tried it different places, but here's what I know. You can create that 60 and 90 seconds. Find your own way to do it. 
figure out where you can get to such a place of peace that what gets revealed to you is a future that you don't know is your future in 60 or 90 seconds. I'm still not sure. I really think he left me in that room longer. It felt longer. There was so many things, so many things. But this is the year of the rabbit. This is the year, the luckiest sign, the year of the rabbit. Happy Chinese New Year and think about this, fortune. Now, for some of us, we may be thinking we're stuck. We're not. We may be thinking we're not going to have a future. We may be thinking it's going to take forever to get there. I never thought about my future after that, and I still don't. I have a vision and a sense for what I'm here to do, and I still count on a lot of people to help me get there. I have a team of great people, Jacob, Benny right here, Jessica, Linda, the whole team. But the thing I know now is the breadcrumbs are going to be put out in front of you. They're going to be there. They're going to be the Brian McGorries, the Dan Vandermosses, the Dara Stoners. I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. You know, the Charlie Brooks, the Gary Handlers, you know, Bob Davis, all of these people. My One of my greatest mentors in my corporate career, Mary Louise Smith, well, boy, she taught me the power of asking the question, what part of the problem are you? All of these things, all of these are breadcrumbs. If you're not awake enough to see the breadcrumbs, you will step on them, you will crush them, and they will be gone. You need to keep your eyes open and your ears alert. I knew at that moment that this was a benevolent universe. It wasn't a pain and suffering and evil damnation place like I was raised to believe in some of my previous religions. That moment changed it for me. I felt benevolence. I felt it. I felt such a place of peace. It changed me as a person. What will change you today? What are you going to focus on? Do you have an Arno Penzias in your life? Maybe it's your child. You know, kids are the greatest messengers. Who is it in your life that is there for you? Who can you be there for? How can you take 60 to 90 seconds and have it be the most transformative experience you've ever had? Can you put down your cell phone for that long? This is the world now of opportunity for all of us. The dreams are a pathway. They're not an end game. They allow us to step in the place of possibilities. They allow us to think like champions, to feel like champions. They allow us to move beyond, you know, the idea of personal pain and suffering to a place that is so much more inviting. You know, that place, that, that cosmic microwave soundless blip on a radar that brought this man to have his dreams revealed. And he didn't do it alone, he had a team. Get a team and know that this year, as you move forward, and I love, I love we just celebrated it over the weekend. I think there are 12 days to celebrate. Think about what the year of the rabbit is. Some of you, if you're born in that year, it's gonna be a different meaning. But find your 60 seconds, find your 90 seconds find them, make them sacred, hold on to them, and then step in the place of knowing. Thank you all for just 20 amazing years. Thank you for, for knowing that there is such a thing as positive talk, and it actually can be a thing. Thank you all for tuning us in, turning us on. We'll see you next time. All clear. Nice job, Pat. Thank you guys. Rock Thanks on. So All right. Have a good day, you too. Thank you.